worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Jesus Christ our Lord. Good morning. Thank you, Joy. Um, I want to ask you to open your bulletin and look at the conference dates and schedule on the bottom right-hand corner of your bulletin and take special notice of the fact that we've changed our schedule on Saturday. Um, we will have a light lunch here. We don't want to have a great big spread, just, a, just something to tie us over. Um, otherwise, we may all get sleepy at 2 o'clock. But uh, then we'll stay and have the second two messages at 2 and 3. So on Saturday, uh, that way you don't have to figure out what to do all day Saturday. Just come and we'll be here from 10 to 4. And um, um, everything else is pretty much the same. We'll be back Sunday morning and have uh, lunch after the service on Sunday. So um, there's a sign-up sheet in the back on the shelf near the kitchen for um, cleanup schedule for each day of the conference and, um, and for some uh, food items that we need on Saturday for lunch. So please take notice of that and, uh, and uh, help out where you can. All right? Um, your bulletin, um, the hymn on the back of your bulletin, I love the way this hymn begins, Come, whosoever will. The wall's up. There's no breaches in it, but the gates are open. Come, come. Nor vainly strive to mend. Don't try to mend your life, and don't try to mend the gospel. It just, it's, it's, a, it's a vain effort. Sinners are freely welcome still to Christ, the sinner's friend. Let's stand together. Bert, come please. <clears throat> Come who so ever will, nor vainly strive to mend, sinners are freely welcome still to Christ a sinner's friend. The gospel table spread and richly furnished too with wine and milk and living bread and dainties not a few. The guilty vile and base, the wretched and forlorn, are welcome to the feast of grace, though goodness they have done. No goodness he expects, he, he came to save the his door his tender loving heart the vilest will embrace and freely to them will impart the riches of his grace be seated Open your Bibles with me to Isaiah 62 for our call to worship, please. Isaiah 62. <clears throat> Verse 1. For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace. The Lord's not going to hold his peace for the sake of his church. His preachers are not going to hold their peace for the sake of his church. 
and his children are not going to hold their peace for the sake of his church. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness and all kings thy glory and thou shalt be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord shall name. So everything's all about the mouth of the Lord and what saith the Lord, isn't it? And that's, that's all we want to know. What's God say about it? <laughs> What's God? Just show me what God says about it. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hephzibah. My delight is in her. And thy land, Beulah, married, married. And the church is called the bride of Christ. We are united in him, in the eternal covenant of grace, the marriage feast of the Lamb. And he calls us married. You're married to me. Everything that belongs to me belongs to my wife. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. <laughs> Usually when we think about rejoicing, we're thinking in terms of us rejoicing in him, aren't we? And here he says, I rejoice over you. I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day nor night. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silent and give him no rest until he establish, until he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Let's pray together. Our merciful Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you've declared so gloriously and so clearly and simply that your church is your bride and that you take delight in her. Lord, we see nothing in ourselves that would cause you to, to feel that way, except that we know that you've made your bride comely with your comeliness. And so, Lord, if by virtue of our union with Christ, we have great hope of knowing that we not only have acceptance with thee, but that we have glory, glory in thy very presence. Lord, bless us this morning. Speak to our hearts. Increase our faith. Forgive us of our many sins. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Would you turn to number 17 in the blue hymnals? You can remain seated. Number 17. Flaming tongues above, 
raised a mountain, fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, by my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Seal it for thy courts above. We're going to begin this morning in Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. <clears throat> By way of introduction, I'd like to read a verse from 1 John chapter 3 that, not properly understood, would cause great fear in the heart of any honest person. Here's what John said. Here's what God says. Was, John was just a penman, wasn't he? Here's what God says. Whoever is born of God doth not sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. What does that mean? <laughs> Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. And like I said, if you're an honest person, you know you've got a lot of sin to deal with in your life, don't you? What does the Lord, what is he talking about? He cannot sin. For his seed remaineth in him. Now what is that seed well, the scripture makes it clear that the seed of Abraham is not many, but one. And that seed is Christ. What John's talking about is what is referred to and declared over and over and over in the word of God. It's the heart of the gospel. It's union with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's exactly what Paul was talking about in Philippians chapter 3 when he said, I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them in dung that I might know him and be found in him, not having my own righteousness. Now men, uh, ignorant of the righteousness of God, go about trying to establish their own righteousness by, well, if I can just sin less, I, I can find acceptance with God. Paul said that I might be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law. But that righteousness, which is by the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God, which is through faith. Union with the Lord Jesus Christ. Having his seed in you and you being his seed in him. Now, I... Uh, if you were here two Wednesday nights ago, you're going to hear some 
things you heard then, but it's good that we, that we repeat ourselves, isn't it? <laughs> uh, the article in the bulletin this morning titled uh, Federal or Seminal Head is a summary of the message that I want to try to preach right now. If you read the commentators of the Bible, they will talk about Adam and Christ being our federal head. What is a federal head? Well, let those who um, hate our current administration say that our president is not their president unless they renounce their citizenship. He is their federal head. Okay? The president of the United States is our federal head in that he represents all of America before the world. And that's what federal means. It means representative. We have a federal a representative government, don't we? Um, and, our, and our federal representatives are supposed to represent the citizens as they make laws and, and uh, policies for the nation. And uh, the writers refer to Adam as our federal head. That he's our representative before God. And then when he fell, we fell in him. Well, in Hebrews chapter 4, the scripture speaks of Levi, who was long after Abraham. Levi being a picture of the priesthood paying tithes to Melchizedek, which was a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember Melchizedek, the priest who had no uh, mother or no father, who, uh, who was the king of Salem, and uh, he was the prince of peace, and Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. How could it be? Uh, Levi. Uh, how could it be that Levi paid tithes to Melchizedek? Well, the Lord tells us how it was. He says that Levi was in the loins of Abraham. So when Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, Levi paid tithes to Melchizedek in Abraham. Now, I know some of you have submitted your DNA to find out who your ancestors are. Uh, and that's fine. I don't want to know anything about skeletons in my closet. But uh, if you want to do that, go for it. You might find out some things you don't want to know. <clears throat> but the truth is that if these DNA tests could go back far enough, we would find that every one of us our ancestors, literally. I mean, you can put it under a microscope. You can see it. We were in the loins of our father, Adam. He wasn't just our representative head. He was our seminal. You see the word we just, the, the word I just read in 1 John chapter 5, or 1 John chapter 3, his seed remaineth in him. That's where the word seminal comes from. Not Seminole, as in Seminole County, where some of us live, but Seminole, as in seed. You see, you and I were literally, physically, in the loins of our father, Adam, when he fell. The President of the United States may be your federal head. Your father and your grandfather are your seminal heads. You came from them. <laughs> and, that's how, and that's our relationship with Adam. So to say that Adam is our federal head is not, doesn't go far enough. Doesn't go far enough. Um, he didn't just represent us. You were there. I was there in the garden. When, let me show you that in the scriptures. Turn with me to uh, Romans chapter 5. (coughs) 
Romans chapter 5. Verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. You see, you and I sinned in our father Adam. We were there. God's not just charging us with our sin. He's not just uh, with Adam's sin. He's not just imputing Adam's guilt to us. We died. You see, Adam died as a man. And everything that was in him, including all your DNA and all my DNA, died with him. Separated from God. And God says, as in Adam, all died. Verse 13, for unto the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. You see, this is even before the law was given by Moses. Death reigned. Everybody that was born died. Why? Because they were already dead in Adam. You were literally there, physically there, in Adam. Now, in the same way, I said we were going to start with Isaiah 61. You have your Bibles open to Isaiah 61? Verse 4, and they shall build the old waste, and they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations, that which was lost in our father Adam, the spiritual death that we inherited from our father Adam. The Lord Jesus Christ declares himself as the one anointed of God to restore that which was lost in Adam. He said, I I came to restore that which I took not away. You're responsible. I'm responsible for Adam's sin. We were there with Adam. We weren't just charged with his sin. We actually committed his sin. And the Lord says, when I come, I'm going to restore all those waste places, all that death, all that destruction. I'm going to declare the year of Jubilee and the terrible day of the Lord. And I'm going to, I'm going to set the captive free. <laughs> I'm going to raise the dead. Tell John, tell John what I have done. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. And the sons of aliens shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. That's me. I'm a son of alien. I'm a Gentile. That's what he's talking about. The Gentiles are going to be brought in. The Gentiles are going to be brought in. And they're actually going to be, they're going to be your vine dressers and your plowmen. They're going to be opening up the mysteries of the gospel to you so that, so that that seed What did Paul say, or Peter said, we're born again, not with corruptible seed, but with the incorruptible, even by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever, which by the gospel is preached unto you. So this seed is called, we're called the seed of Christ. Christ is called the seed. It's it's all, you see, it's it's a connection. We've got to be in him. Now, some of you all are aware of some controversy that's going on with some preachers as to whether or not Christ was actually made sin or whether he just bore the guilt of our sin. We'll get to that in a moment. This clears up all that. This clears up all that. Verse 6, But you shall be named the priest of the Lord. A royal priesthood, a holy nation. (laughs) What does a priest have? He has access to God. How are you and I going to enter into the very presence of a holy God? 
Only if there's no sin in us. How are we going to be without sin to be found in him? And we can come boldly to the throne of grace to find help in our time of need. You see, God's eyes, Habakkuk says, are too pure to look upon iniquity. He can't have anything to do with sin. He can only behold that which is righteous, that which is perfect in his sight. How's God going to have anything to do with me? I'm going to have to be found in Christ. Just like I was in my father Adam, so spiritually, not physically, but spiritually, I'm going to have to be found in Christ. You see, God put a particular people in Christ, in the covenant of grace, before time ever began, before the foundation of the world. God's never seen his people outside of Christ. He loved us even before we knew him, even before we loved him. Why? Because just like we were in Adam, so we were in Christ. We are called his seed. Isaiah chapter 53 says, It pleased the Lord to bruise him. And make his soul an offering for sin. Now what was in the soul of the Lord Jesus Christ? It wasn't just our sin. You see, Christ didn't just bear our sin in his body on Calvary's cross. He bore us. We're called the body of Christ. We're married to him by virtue of our union with Christ. We were in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why in Philippians chapter 3, Paul goes on to say when he said that I might be found in him. And then the next verse says, and that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. That I could, that God would, would show me that I was in Christ. <laughs> That's why Paul was able to say I'm crucified with Christ I was crucified in Christ. I'm in the body of Christ, seminally. And that verse in Isaiah 53, it pleased the Lord to bruise him and make his soul an offering for sin, and he, God the Father, shall see his seed. God the Father saw his people in Christ. You see, it's not, if a, if a judge punishes one person for the crime of another, that's not justice. That's not justice. The person who committed the crime has to be punished. And that's exactly what happened on Calvary's cross. God's people were in Christ, and when it pleased God to bruise his son and, and to see the travail of his soul, God was satisfied because God saw his seed he saw those who were in Christ just like I fell literally physically in my father Adam and you did too so we were raised in the likeness of, of Christ let me show you that turn with me to to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. It wasn't just that the Lord Jesus Christ was bearing the guilt of our sin. Whether he was, God made him who knew no sin to be sin. Yes, he, he bore our sin. There's no question about it. And he owned it as his own because he was owning his people as his own. He was owning us as his bride. <laughs> he cannot forsake his bride. He cannot forsake his people. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And he didn't leave us or forsake us on Calvary's cross. He owned us <laughs> on Calvary's cross. He suffered the wrath of God's justice because he was bearing his seed in himself on the cross. God was exercising his justice against all of his people, every single one of them. Romans chapter 6, 
Verse 3, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? He said, that's what we represent here. When, when a person submits to baptism, they are publicly declaring that when Christ died, I died. I was in Christ. He didn't just bear my sin, he bore me. And now the Lord's saying, do you not know that if you've been baptized, you've been baptized into his death, wherefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. The only thing that gives the child of God any power whatsoever over their sin is to see themselves in union with Christ. That's, that's it. That's Look what he goes on to say. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. He was offered up for our offenses and raised again because of our justification, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. <laughs> that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we, henceforth we should not serve sin. The only thing that makes me not want to sin is just to know that my sins, I, I'm dead in Christ. My sins have been put away, all of it. <laughs> There's such liberty in that. The strength of sin is the law. You put a person under the law and all it does is excite their passions for sin. That's all the law does. Grace is the only thing that takes away the power of sin. It's the only thing that takes it away. And every child of God, I know if you're a believer, you're, you're interested. Why? You see, Michael, you mentioned this the other day when you read scripture. And uh, it's such a good point. When the children of Israel were in the wilderness and they were being bitten by snakes. Those snakes represent our sin. And uh, you know, if, if the world was full of viper serpents today, the, the religious organization would be having conferences on how to kill snakes and how to tame snakes and how to defang snakes and how to control snakes and, you know, all that kind of stuff. What would God say? What would God say? Now, you got snakes crawling around your feet. It's kind of hard to take your eyes off of them, isn't it? And it's hard to take your eyes off your sin, isn't it? It is. I know it is. What did the Lord say? Look at the brazen serpent on the pole. And thou shalt be healed. Healed of what? Healed of those snakes on the ground. <laughs> you see, you don't, you, don't, you don't conquer the snakes on the ground by stomping on the snakes. You conquer the snakes on the ground by looking at the serpent on the pole. The Lord Jesus Christ is that brazen serpent who was made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And here he says we were actually in him. We were crucified in him. So sin's been, it's been put away. The penalty of it has been put away. And if you've given faith to look to Christ, the power of it and the glorious truth of knowing that one day the presence of it Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. Sin was destroyed. Every bit of it. It's already been paid for. For he that is dead is freed from sin. <laughs> Have you ever noticed in your own life how when people have low expectations of you, all of a sudden the pressure's off and you can, you can do better, actually, at whatever you do, whatever it is. Whereas when somebody has a really high expectation of you and, and then all the pressure's on, and 
Well, what I'm saying to you, what God's saying is the pressure's off. The pressure's off. All sin's been put away. You've already been put to death. (laughs) The law's been fulfilled. God's justice has already been satisfied. (laughs) It's done. You're free. Now, I know the unbeliever will say, well, you're just giving folks a license to sin. No, we're not. It's the only thing that makes me not want to sin is looking to that serpent on the pole and knowing that God put him to death and I was seminally in him. He's not just my federal head. He's not just my representative. I am in the body of Christ and his body. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ had to be made flesh. He had to be made flesh because we are his body. (laughs) And that body had to be punished. And what the Lord's saying is, you're free. You're dead. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we should also live with him. Verse 9, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death has no more dominion over him. For that in he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead. (laughs) To be dead, indeed, unto sin. (laughs) You're already dead. Sin shall no longer have dominion over you. Now, you know this word reckon. It means, well, every time you use your GPS on your phone, that phone is dead reckoning your position off of various different satellites, triangulating your exact position. We use that word reckon in the South to say, well, you know, I reckon it could be this way or reckon it could be that way. Meaning, meaning, well, you know, I don't know. (laughs) It means just the opposite. This is God saying, this is a dead reckoning. It's true. Reckon ye yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. How can I reckon it to be so when sin is ever so present with me? Because it is so. It is so. If you're in Christ, you died in him, and God saw the travail of his soul, and God saw his seed, and God is satisfied. (laughs) And sin has no more power. It's been put away. Does that not free you up? That's why the Lord said where's the... Where the Spirit of God is, there is liberty. And if the Son hath made you free, you are free indeed. Indeed. The gospel of God's free grace in the finished work of our seminal head, our Savior, is freedom freedom it's not based on your performance (laughs) it's based on his performance and what he performed you performed and what he suffered you suffered his life is our life every bit of it why Because God's people have been in him from the foundation of the world. Everything he did, everything he is, we are. And that's why John said, as he is, so are we in this world. Not we're going to be like him in that day. That's going to be a glorious day. But he said in this world right now. Right now. (laughs) 
You know, the first time seed is mentioned in the scripture is found in Genesis chapter 1 on the third day of creation when God says, the fruit yielding tree whose seed is in it bringing forth the same likeness. <laughs> what a picture. That's the first time seed's mentioned. You take a seed off a tree and you plant that seed, you're going to get the same tree that seed came off of. And then the second time it's mentioned is in Genesis chapter 3 when the Lord said, I, speaking to the serpent, to Satan, said, I will put enmity between thy seed and her seed. And you will bruise his heel, but he is going to crush your head. <laughs> and, then when, and then when Eve gave birth to, to, uh, to Cain, she said, I've received the man. She thought the one, the seed of the woman now, that he's our savior. He's going to restore us back to, uh, back to, to, to uh, Eden. He didn't restore them back to Eden at all, did he? Matter of fact, the first man ever born turned out to be a murderer. And he's a picture of every man after him. Verse 11 in, Gen in Romans chapter 6, Likewise reckon ye yourselves also to be dead indeed unto in sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies that you should obey its lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead. <laughs> Adam, you've been put to death. <laughs> you, were, you were put to death in Adam man you guess you were named after and in the last Adam you see the Lord Jesus Christ came to do spiritually what the first Adam did physically for sin shall not have dominion over you for you're not under law you want sin to have dominion over you just get some idea in your mind that your acceptance before God is performance-based. And sin will have dominion over you. It's just that simple. But to know that all of your acceptance before God is because you were in Christ and that God poured out the fury of his wrath on all your sin, that's the... You see, look into that serpent on the pole. It's the only way to conquer the snakes on the ground. Verse 15, what shall we sin? You see, here's what some people are going to say. Are you giving us license to sin? What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. You missed the point altogether. <laughs> know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, servants you are whom you obey, whether sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness, but God be thanked that you were servants of sin. It's all you could do. Unable to believe God, unable to see yourself in Christ, unable to know that, that God was satisfied with the justice that he, that he punished the Lord Jesus Christ with you? You couldn't do any. Why? Because sin had dominion. All you could see was the law. All you could see was your performance. All you could see was what you do. You couldn't see what he, was, what he had done because you were thinking there's something you had to do. But you have obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. And that's all I'm, my heart's desire this morning is to deliver, to, you, to, the, to deliver unto you the doctrine that will set you free. 
free. Being then made free from sin. Free. You become the servants of righteousness. Whosoever is born of God doth not sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin. He cannot sin. (laughs) For he is born of God. Born of God. Now, you know the truth of that has absolutely nothing to do with your performance and has everything to do with his. Our Heavenly Father, we're, we're hopeful that you will speak peace and comfort and truth to our hearts and enable us to trust the Lord Jesus Christ for all the hope of our salvation. For it's in his name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Number 32. 32 in the spiral hymnal. Eternal 